Hello, I'm Fred Opelinski, pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in downtown Reading, and I'm de delighted that you've chosen to watch this broadcast. I'm grateful also to those who have provided financial support so that this ministry can continue. If you were able to join in that support, we certainly invite you to consider it. You can check out our website for further information. Just know that we welcome a contribution in any amount so that we can continue this ministry which has been a part of our life and witness for nearly 40 years. God bless you and thanks again. Hello, I am Fred Opelinski, pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in downtown Reading and I am delighted to welcome you to this broadcast of our Sunday morning worship, this third Sunday in Lent. Uh, if you and I are thirsty, what do we do? It's pretty easy to take care of, right? We get a glass and find our way to the nearest tap to quench that thirst. In Jesus' day, as in much of the world today, it was a good deal more difficult than that. And it's the woman's task every morning to go to the nearest well or stream with water jugs or buckets uh, to take care of her family's needs for the day. Today's gospel reading, Jesus encounters a woman at the well in the middle of the afternoon and she has what is the longest dialogue he has. Oh, I'm sorry. Gee, gee whiz. I'm almost there. One more time. This will do it. Hello, I'm Fred Opelinski, pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in downtown Reading. And it's my delight to welcome you to this broadcast of our Sunday morning in worship for the third Sunday in Lent. If you or I get thirsty, it's pretty easy to supply that, isn't it? We get a glass, go to the nearest tap and our thirst is quenched. But as you probably know, in Jesus' day, and for much of the world today, it's a good deal more difficult. It's the woman's job to go to the well or to the stream early in the morning and to get the supply of water that she and her family need for the rest of the day. In today's Gospel reading from John, Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman at the well in the middle of the afternoon and he has with her a dialogue that is really the longest exchange like this in the entire Gospels. They talk about so many different things, but he wants to bring her to receive the gift of water so that she'll never thirst again. The water that only he can provide. The gift of water that brings eternal life. I hope that you are as intrigued by this story as I and that in it, you may find the blessing of that gift, life eternal from Christ Jesus. God bless you.
merciful God, the fountain of living water, you quench our thirst and wash away our sin. Give us this water always. Bring us to drink from the well that flows with the beauty of your truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to find food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? And the woman left her water jug and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And so the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? 
But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. You won't be surprised if I tell you you have just experienced the longest dialogue in any of the Gospels. <laughs> that marvelous conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well. John places this story right after last week's visit of Nicodemus to Jesus. And it seems clear by that placement that he wants us to see the extraordinary contrasts between the two stories. If you were here last week, you remember how Nicodemus was a highly educated and respected Jewish religious leader, whereas this woman is uneducated and with a very questionable reputation, she gives Liz Taylor a run for the husband count. And she's a Samaritan, much maligned to boot. We'll more of that later. Do you remember from last week when Nicodemus comes to meet Jesus? Anybody? Nick, uh, what is it? At night, Nick at night, that's right. While the woman encounters him at high noon. Nicodemus' visit lasts about 17 verses and he leaves quietly. Under the cover of darkness, he leaves full of doubt. Women's encounter, on the other hand, goes on for 37 verses, ending with her enthusiastic invitation to anybody who would listen. Come and see this Jesus. Maybe he's the Messiah. As we've discovered in our Lenten studies, John is writing this gospel to a church moving through challenging birth pains 70 or maybe 80 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. The first thing he's showing in this story is how Jesus confronted and overturned so many of the social norms and religious rules of the day. He was a rebel with a cause. I mean, first off, he went to Samaria. He had to go there, John writes, when any upstanding Jew, especially a rabbi, would avoid Samaria at all costs. The Samaritans, as you may remember, were half-breeds, mongrels, no longer pure Jewish blood. Centuries earlier, they had intermarried with the Assyrian invaders and even got mixed up with some of their gods. After the first temple was destroyed down in Jerusalem, they built their own temple up at Mount Gerizim, one that the Jews returning from exiles eventually destroyed. But they continued worshiping there anyway because, well, because they certainly weren't welcome in Jerusalem. And as if that weren't enough to distance them from proper Jews, Samaritans held as scripture only the books of Moses, the first five books, ignoring the Psalms, the wisdom literature, the prophets, and the rest. So in Jewish eyes, Samaritans were contaminated, perverse people, unworthy to be called children of Abraham. Visiting Samaria was almost unthinkable. 
talking to Samaritans or touching anything of theirs would make a Jew ritually unclean. Sidebar, when Jesus told the parable of the good Samaritan, it would have been bewildering, shocking even to the hearers, somewhat like compassionate terrorist might sound to us today. Well, back to the story. Jesus had to go to Samaria, says John. And so he goes, and it's midday, maybe 100 degrees or more, and Jesus is thirsty. He sends the disciples off to the city for some food, and he waits there by Jacob's well. When this Samaritan woman comes by, he asks her for a drink. Hear the alarm bell going off. Good Jewish men never speak to women in public. In fact, back then, married men didn't even speak to their wives in public. And yet here is a rabbi in this very public place asking for a drink from a Samaritan woman. Add to the scandal that she's coming to the well at noon while respectable women came in the sensible cool of early morning. More red flags are raised. I mean, is she coming to avoid contact with others? To miss the barbs of gossipers? We don't know the reason, but be sure it can't be good. Well, right off, she realizes the strangeness of Jesus' request. She reminds him that he is risking defilement. And then Jesus tells her that if she asked, he could provide her with living water. The Greek word there really means free-flowing water, water from a stream or a river. Drink this well water and you're going to be thirsty again. But drink my water, says Jesus, and you will never thirst again. Well, she's eager for it. So Jesus asks her to go and bring her husband back. She tells him she has none, and Jesus says he knows she's had five, and the one she's living with now is not her husband. Even more alarm bells and red flags. But the point here is not so much the woman's reputation. It is rather that Jesus knows all about this stranger. He knows her background, her secrets, her sins. And that knowledge, of course, astounds her. She realizes that he must come from God, and she brings up a hot topic between Jews and Samaritans, the right place to worship. Is it Jerusalem or Gerizim? Neither, says Jesus. The real issue is not where to worship God, but how, in spirit and in truth. God is not tied down to a box or a building or a mountain, but rather God is more like the wind, the breath, the spirit, blowing where God's will, follow, following the power and giving the life of God. So, do you see how, God loads, how John loads up this story to this point? The images of living water bubbling up, moving along, the image of God is blowing spirit, life-giving breath. Jesus wants us to see a God beyond human control, in fact, beyond human understanding, a God who breaks down human divisions and shakes up human tradition. In Jesus, God unleashes the power of love that knows no boundaries. Through Christ comes rich, life abundant, and everlasting. Then you heard what happens next, huh? That encounter with Jesus at the well, that little sip of living water, sends her running into town, leaving the water jug behind. I love that detail from John. She's got more important things to do. She goes to town and tells everyone who will listen that this man knows all about her. Come and see him. This man knows everything about her and loves her anyway. And then stunning, really, is when John tells us that they actually pay attention to her. They come out to be with Jesus. 
I mean, the people in town must have known who she was, her reputation or her bad luck with husbands. She's the kind that talks to men in public. And yet, they believed her. Her compelling witness motivated them to come out and see him, and meeting Jesus, they too came to believe. It's astounding, really. Contrary to every expectation, this shady Samaritan woman of all people becomes a most amazing evangelist. Long story. Lots of details, lots of layers of meaning. We could dig into the story for a good long time. But this morning, I'd like to simply offer it up to you as our story. Jesus comes to us at the well, the stream, the fountain called baptism, washing us to new life with his living water. Jesus comes to us and he knows each of our lives better than we ourselves do. And yet he welcomes us into his fellowship. He welcomes us to his table each week, offering to everyone here the bread of life and cup of salvation. Then no matter our flaws or shortcomings, he sends us out from this place with a story to tell and an invitation to offer, come and see Jesus. It's at this point that I really would like to focus a bit. I mentioned that John was writing this gospel in a very difficult time in the early church's life. After the destruction of the second temple by the Romans, at a time when there was so much turmoil and uncertainty, Jewish traditions were a shambles without the temple. The young church was fragile caught in a dangerous place between the Jewish struggle to hold on and the Roman demand for allegiance. That the church somehow survived those years is a testimony to God's devotion to its mission. The church could only thrive through all of that peril because believers like this woman continued to invite others to come and see, to come and experience. Once they met the risen Jesus, then he could take over the faith building. But that invitation, do you see how important it was to get them to him? I fear that long ago we have lost that zeal for mission. We'd rather leave evangelism up to the paid professionals or the Mormons, I suppose. Perhaps it's because some want the church to be their undisturbed little comfort zone and others quip, well, the door's open for anybody that wants to come in, let them come. But do you see how those attitudes, frankly, are a death sentence for the church? Even worse, I think, they are a death sentence for those who don't know Jesus, who haven't yet tasted of his living water. I think it's time for some honesty here. The Lutheran Church happened to grow so strong in this Reading area, Mother Trinity gave birth to those 11 children around the city, not because we were such great evangelists, but because those boatloads of people kept coming from Germany. Well, perhaps you've noticed those boats stopped uh, about a century ago. And we're not what we used to be, and some of Mama's children are frankly shriveling on the vine. It's not because the fields are barren. It's not because God's forgotten about us. Rather, I think it's because there are so few who are willing to tell about their experience with Jesus, or so unwilling to offer that precious invitation to come and see. I mean, the woman at the well did not have all the answers. She wasn't theologically trained. She wasn't privy to any surefire evangelism techniques. 
but she found life in Jesus. And from that, she simply spoke from her heart. That encounter with the Lord propelled her into town and to tell the story to anybody who would listen. Martin Luther once described evangelism as simply one hungry sinner telling another where to find bread. I urge you, dear family in Christ, to consider doing just that. In these remaining weeks of Lent, think about how Jesus might have changed your life. Consider what faith means to you, how old Trinity matters. If you find there's a reason for being here with the Lord, forgiveness, strength, community, hope, whatever it is, offer that gift to someone else so that they can come and discover it and they can come and know Jesus, his life and love abundance. Please understand, I ask you to consider this not for the sake of Trinity. Temples come and go and so do congregations. Trinity will be here as long as God has a purpose for it. But rather, I invite you to share the gospel for the sake of others. Trust that if God can use this questionable, questioning Samaritan woman, God can most certainly use you to overcome divisions and differences to make his grace real. God can use you to offer warm welcome to the word of truth. God calls us all, as Jesus told Nicodemus, because God so loves the world. God comes to you and works through you so that God can save it. Amen. Turning to the Lord our God, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. We invite you to kneel or be seated for the prayers. Lead your church that justified by faith, it may bear testimony to your grace, your power, and your way of life. We pray for our bishops, Elizabeth and Samuel, and for those who serve with them, for our covenant congregation, Christ Episcopal Church, and for Father John, for the people of Nativity Lutheran Church and their pastor, Eileen, and for Grace Lutheran Church in Shillington. Hear us, O oh God. Pour out your 
Bring the healing power of rain where there is drought and warmth to those who are cold. Hear us, O God. Pour out your peace upon the earth so that nations and their leaders ensure that the needs of their people are met. We pray for an end to aggression and warfare and for lasting peace in the Middle East. Hear us, O God. Satisfy the thirst of all who long for you, the hungry, the poor, the fearful, and the ill, especially Armand, Adeline, Dorothy, Barbara, Virginia, Ralph, Bill, Frank, Andrea, Beth, David, Rodney and Dorothy, Tom, Pat, Joan, Brian, Bill, Nan, and Jan Rita, and those others we now name. that they draw deeply from your well of hope. Hear us, O God. Bless this congregation that showered with the promises of baptism, we welcome those who thirst for you. Be with our brothers and sisters whom we lift in prayer this week. Jennifer, Kevin, and Avery Mazur, Allison, Laura, Lindsay, and William McCanny, Tama and David McConnell, and Blair and Tate DeWalt, Laura and Neil McGettigan, and Donald and Jeannie McHenry. Hear us, O oh God. We give you thanks for all the saints who endured in this world and have now entered your eternal rest. Hear us, O oh God. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray trusting in your abundant mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 